We're continuing in our series on 2 Timothy 3.16. I think this is the fifth lesson already in that series. Uh, although on the outline there it says uh, this is the third lesson about inspiration. We've been covering doctrines about the Bible. We had, we had an introductory lesson in our 2 Timothy 3.16 on Tuesday, I think maybe three weeks ago now, where we talked about it in con this verse in context a little bit, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, what the context uh, is explaining. We also dealt with the fact that these Scriptures are called holy in 2 Timothy 3.15. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures is what Paul says. And so we dealt with what that meant that it was holy and why it's the inspiration that makes them holy. It's that they're inspired of God. That's why they're, they're holy. And so we've been getting into the last three or four weeks what inspiration is. This, this very important fundamental of Christianity without which there is no Christianity. You say, well I thought it was about Christ. Yes, Christianity is about Christ and that's also a fundamental. Uh, but you get your understanding of Christ from the Scripture. Yes. And without the Scripture, you have no understanding of Christ. Amen. You can't trust your understanding of Christ. And so the Scripture is the foundation upon which we can know and understand today who Jesus Christ is and what He did and who He made you. Uh, and so I've been covering this inspiration doctrine so we can explain and understand it. A lot of Christians and churches, if they believe doctrine of inspiration, will simply assert it and move on. And, and that's good for moving on. But if you don't understand how that foundation works, then when it breaks or has cracks in it, you don't recognize it. And then the whole house comes tumbling down in, in an instant, and you don't know why. Uh, and culturally, that's what's happened in the church. People have been attacking the Word of God, specifically the doctrine of inspiration, for over a century now in, in, our, in our culture. And Christians really haven't had a good response to it, just kind of ignore the attacks or accept and concede to the attacks. And saying, well, it's not important. We can give that up. We can give the Bible up uh, as long as we have Jesus. And you cannot. Okay, you cannot. So we've been trying to deal with this to solidify our understanding in it. And so how we've been talking about it is that God speaks. How is it possible that we have a, a, a scripture, a, a book, a Bible that was given by God? Well, one is that God speaks. And that speaking of God is called revelation. When God reveals uh, His will, what He knows, uh, things about us, whatever it is that He reveals, when God speaks, that's called revelation. And God has spoken, as Hebrews says in chapter 1, verse 1, and this is a, a historical fact. At that moment right there, we've already lost people in our culture, you understand. They don't think God has ever spoken. And you say, well, what's the proof that He's spoken? Uh, we dealt back in those lessons earlier on about uh, just creation itself says something about God. Not verbally, obviously, but it says something when you think about it. But also, even in the instances and events in history, you take Jesus himself, you take the Bible itself as evidence. And uh, that's where, again, they'll throw you out the window and say, you can't use the Bible to, as proof. You can and you must. Amen. Without using the Scripture, there is no proof. You see, it is the proof. Some folks will be so foolish to laugh at you when you say that, but that's not a laughable thing. You don't go to court and they say, where's the evidence? You say, right here. And someone laughs at you, that's not evidence. If you're submitting the thing and it speaks of the subject, it's evidence. And that's what the Bible is. So meanwhile, God speaks. That's revelation. People will, will mock Christians and their belief of the Bible and say, well, that Bible was written by men. Yes, God speaking to men is called revelation. God speaking through men is called prophecy. Right. Well, we don't believe in prophecy. That's because you don't believe in God. If God speaks, there can be prophecy. Because all it takes for a prophet to be is that God said something to him and he speaks what he said. As in, thus saith the Lord, or God told me this. And I know there's many false prophets. The Bible even testifies of them. Okay, 2 Peter 1 verse 21 says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the very next verse says, and there are many false prophets. Uh, there are many people who falsely claim to be speaking for God and are not. And so it is a requirement to be skeptical and to try to discern who is and who is not, who has spoke for God. But revelation has occurred, and prophecy is the thing. And so when God instructed men to write the words down in a book, that process of writing down words that was given by revelation is what is technically called inspiration, or what we're concerned with in our subject of inspiration, the written words. The written words. It's not the spoken words that a prophet would speak heard from God. It's the written words. That's what inspiration concerns. 
when you're talking about the spoken words and whether the spoken words are of God, you're talking about revelation. Did God tell them that or did they invent that in their mind? Right? So when some Christian walks up to you or some other nutcase and says, you know, God told me this and they're telling you through their spoken words, the question there is, did God actually reveal it to them? And you can deal with this through our study of the Bible doctrine, actually, in this, this series we'll deal with that. Now you can know whether or not it's actually revelation. But part of that concerns this. If what they have been told of God is not aligned with what God has said to be written down, there's a big problem. Because yeah. what's written down is objective for all of us to read. What was spoken to certain people, we don't know. We simply, it's all subjective to that person. It requires us hearing and then making a judgment about it. But if God wrote it down, we can all read the same words, and thus we can understand what God said. So the written words are the inspiration of Scripture. Scripture meaning written words. They were God-given by inspiration. We covered this this last Sunday, how that God moved men. Again, 2 Peter 1, verse 21 said, holy men of God were moved by God, by the Holy Ghost. And in fact, in two other places, it says they were moved by God, moved by the Son, moved by the Spirit. So the Godhead's involved in moving men. And that seems very, very, very mystical and, and kind of vague at, at, at one level. Another level seems very uncharacteristic of what we talk about in this dispensation of grace. I mean, we're not charismatic, right? I mean, he's not moving me left and right every day. Well, there is a teaching about God's moving us, uh, God having effect in us. And we covered that on Sunday, is that being by faith, faith in the Word of God. And when you trust the gospel and you hear the Word of God and you believe the Word of God, that changes the way you think. It changes what you think will happen. It changes how you think of yourself in the world. And thus it changes your perspective and moves you to a certain position. Yeah. Right? And so that is God moving you. It's used wrongly to say, well, God moved me to move 10 miles west. You know, well, where's that revelation that told you to move 10 miles west? Well, he didn't actually tell me. Well, then stop saying God moved you to do that. Uh, if God moved you, that means he's revealed something or he's somehow working through his will and his word to affect change in you. And we'll be covering more about this in our Will of God seminar coming up. It's very important. You know, if I believe in God, believe that he speaks, I believe that men should and can be moved by him. Uh, but we didn't know how that is. How does he speak to us? Right? How do we find his revelation? Right? Well, I'm giving you some clues here. He wrote, he wrote a book. You know, that's very important. So how do we know this is his book? So God moved men by faith to write. And that was specifically what we were studying on Sunday. He moved men who by faith, these weren't unbelievers, people who believed God and what he said by prophecy, by revelation, uh, to write words according to his will. Yeah. Right? And so these men of faith, these holy men of God by faith, so we can, we can put this instrument here of faith, and we'll put a, a Ticonderoga pencil here. Because, of course, that's what they used to write the scripture, right? Ticonderoga with an eraser and everything. No. Um, <laughs> another reason why we have to study this doctrine of inspiration, folks, is if we don't, people start laughing at us as if we don't think about what we believe. We really need to know what we believe. They didn't use Ticonderoga pencils. But by faith, they wrote things down, believing what God told them to do. They wanted to do what God said. Uh, and many times God said, write this in a book. Other times he didn't say that, but what he did say he was doing required they write things down in a book. And so all this ended up being in the form of a book, which we'll cover tonight what kind of book that is. But God moved men by faith to write according to his, his will, or to say it another way, according to his purpose. Right? God has had a purpose, and we know now looking back, part of that purpose was to have his inspired word, Holy Scriptures, complete and finished. Uh, well, men wrote this book. Men moved by God, men of faith, uh, wrote words that were God-given that God spoke to them, Amen. right? Or spoke through them. Now, this idea we covered on Sunday, we mentioned this idea that these men were writing for reasons often, well, in fact, maybe in every case, uh, that they d did not include their understanding of the finished product. Which is one way we know that this is an inspiration of God, because that is a, a, a miracle in itself. A miracle being something issued from God, not something that happens naturally. It doesn't happen naturally that 40 different men from different uh, times and different eras and, and different intents collectively produce something that is a unit and has an influence that surpasses any individual writing that they had. 
and that explains more than any individual writing that they had, and it has a greater function than any individual intent that they had. I mean, where, how do you do that? That is not natural. That is supernatural. That is a miracle. And so the Bible is that. But this idea that people were writing in the Bible, and though they were trying to do the will of God, the will of God they were trying to do was not God told them, guys, I'm trying to write a Bible, and you're the first part. You know, you write the first chapter, you get the second chapter. God didn't explain it that way. Right. So what, what kind of will were they doing? We'll cover that here in a moment. But this is a common theme throughout the Scripture, that people by faith will obey God or do what He says or want to do His will, desire to do His will, and not know His ultimate end. This is a very common thing. You and I in this dispensation, again this is a seminar subject coming up, um, know the end will of God. We know the mystery of His will, the ultimate goal that He's trying to accomplish, because the manifold wisdom of God has been revealed. The mystery of His will is revealed. We know the end, because God's revealed it, as far as His purpose is concerned. But that's not been the case throughout history of, of, of the Bible and through the history of mankind. Uh, Abram, for example. And these guys here, Abram, Joseph, Moses, David, Peter, Paul, and many others, were writers of Scripture. But all of them did not know the end purpose, in this case being the product of this holy book. They didn't know that when they were writing it. Okay? Abram, for example, was called away from his family, remember. Right? He's called to go to this land far away. And even in his own life, as we read about his history, he was called to go away, and by faith he believed God told him to do that. God spoke to him and said, come out of your country, right? Um, leave your family. And even though he said that, Abram didn't even know he was going to get a covenant of the circumcision or was going to have a grandson. He didn't know that. He was just called out. Right? And then later God gave him more things. And maybe in response in, in some parts to his obedience. You see. So you, you read that too. Joseph, for example, it happened to him um, where he had the dream and the vision of the stars and the heaven and things like that and the moon uh, bowing down to him. But he didn't know that he was going to be second to Pharaoh. He didn't know that he was going to Egypt. He didn't know that. God did. He didn't. Amen. But he had faith in God. Right? It's not that he had faith in nothing. It's what God told him he believed. And then when God saw his faith, he did something else through him. So you know, people often teach this idea that, well, these people didn't know what God's purpose was, but they had faith. And they present it as if their faith was empty. It wasn't empty. It had an object. It just wasn't a thing that it ended up being that God would accomplish through them. And that's okay. Right? Uh, you have Moses, for example, who knew that he wanted to, that God was going to use him to deliver Israel. He knew that before God sent him back to Israel. You can read back there where he was raised in Pharaoh's household. And remember when he killed the Egyptian? In Acts it talks about him doing that because he, 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 this is the way I'm going to deliver Israel. You know, I'm in, I'm, I'm, I've got training in, in, in the Pharaoh's house. I've got position in the Pharaoh's house. And all my, my kinsmen are slaves. So this is how I'm going to deliver the people. You know, my people, right? That wasn't the way God wanted him to do it, right? But he knew that there was some calling of God on him to be a deliverer. He knew that he was special among his kinsmen. He eventually spent 40 years in the wilderness after that, right? Um, so there are certain things he knew, and he believed God and trusted him about the things that he knew, and yet God was going to accomplish something else through him that he didn't yet know. Even when God sent him back to deliver Israel, he knew nothing of the law, right? So he went back and delivered Israel uh, through the plagues and all that, and didn't know as they were walking out of Egypt that how he, we were going to get fed. Moses didn't know that. God didn't tell him that in the wilderness back there with Jethro. Hey, hey listen, Moses, you're going to go back and deliver the people, then I'll give man in the wilderness, and then I'll give you that. He didn't tell him all that. He believed what he was told, and then as it progressed on, God revealed more. Amen. You see? Now, this is very important to understand because the Bible itself was revealed progressively. So, again, writers in Scripture did not know what was going to come after. This is fundamental to dispensational Bible study, is it not? Right? And so you see how the understanding of the Bible, as we'll cover in a couple of weeks, is, is connected to your understanding of how the Bible itself was put together. If you think the Bible was inspired in such a way that everyone in the Bible knew what was happening throughout it, or everyone in the Bible was using the Bible as you would use the Bible, then you're missing out on how to study it. I keep bringing up the, the Chosen TV series just because it's a talk of certain evangelical circles. But um, one of the episodes, among other blasphemies that are there, there there's one of them where um, the Sermon on the Mount episode, I think it's one of the final episodes, uh, where Jesus is preparing his sermon like a preacher in 2022. 
And so, yeah, I love the groans. Are, I love the audible groans. Yes, isn't it terrible? Like he's preparing this sermon because that's a great sermon, right? The Sermon on the Mount. And so it shows him preparing, and he's talking to Matthew because Matthew records this long sermon. And he's getting advice from Matthew about how to begin the sermon. And uh, he even is behind this giant tent platform where he asks the women, what robe should I wear today? And they pick the purple one, you know, the blue one, because that's going to look good on the pictures that we paint later, you know. Uh, it's just ridiculous. But and you think, well, that's just all fun. We're just having a little fun with it. It's, it's not biblical, number one. But number two, it, it teaches the wrong thing, that how people do church now is how it was done then. And that's not the case. Yeah. And that's what I'm, the point I'm trying to make, is that you and I with a Bible in the church, and we're told to study it, and we study the scripture that we do, is not how anyone in the Bible actually used it. You understand? And that's perfectly acceptable. Because they were living in a time where God's, part of his purpose, his hidden purpose, by the way, was to create a Bible. He didn't tell that to people. He was trying to create a Bible. Then the Bible was created, and they had a purpose. Again, we'll cover this in a couple of weeks. That part of that purpose and function was for understanding in the church, the body of Christ, in us. And so, again, there's a connection there to the mystery purpose of God, because it also was hidden. You know, so we'll deal with that. Another correlation, by the way, between Christ and Scripture. There's a mystery of Christ, and there was a mystery about this book that was not known until it was done, which was like what it was used for. Right? So, meanwhile, we'll get to that in the future. You had Moses, you had David. David, who, remember the, the David and Goliath story, right? David had faith in God, right? Yeah. What, why did David kill Goliath? Why did he step out like that in courage? Because God had made a covenant with Israel. It wasn't just because he was bold and believing God for no reason. God had promised that he would defend Israel against his enemies. He said that. And David trusted what he said. And thus he had faith. And so what he was doing was response to his faith that he heard God tell them. You see? But David at that moment didn't know anything about the uh, promised mercy he would later get from God. You see what I'm saying? And so that's part of your Bible. You know David, you look at all these attributes and characteristics of his life and everything that God did through him, the Psalms and all that. When he killed Goliath, he hadn't written a Psalm yet that was inspired. You see? So I'm trying to show you the progressive nature of how the Scripture was produced through these men that had faith in what God had said already to them. Okay? The same with Peter and Paul. Paul gets saved in Acts 9. Yes, we all agree to that. He gets saved in Acts 9. He gets told there a few things you can read about in Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. All those record what happened in Acts 9. And he learns some things. Like, God can save by grace, because he saved me by grace. And that God's long-suffering and showing mercy, because that's what he showed towards me. He learned those things. He learned that uh, he was a chosen vessel to go preach this grace to other people. He learned that. He learned Jesus was the Messiah, was the Son of God, the very thing Peter was preaching that he denied. He learned that was true. So there was lots of things he learned there in Acts 9. But he didn't learn everything in Acts 9. No. So there were things that he learned later. But he believed what he learned then. Amen. And so his faith began there. And so faith requires you believe what God says, but the writers of Scripture didn't have everything he was going to say. You have the whole book. right? And so that, that's a difference between you and where the writers sat. Okay, um, so they believed before seeing the end product. You believe because you have the end product. You see the difference? Everyone's believing what God said. It's just you have the words inspired written down. Okay, they didn't have that finished product. So Genesis 50 verse 20 I mentioned on Sunday at the very end of the lesson is a common quoted passage to talk about how God uses things and circumstances and events to accomplish his purpose that isn't always known by us. And it's true. In the scripture, there's people who are living, in fact, everyone in the scripture was living at a time in which God had not completely revealed his purpose. Because that was revealed finally to the Apostle Paul. So no doubt Joseph in Genesis 50, he, he didn't even have the book of Genesis as far as it compiled with the, the law there by Moses. But in Genesis 50 verse 20, Joseph explains to his, his brothers, as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. And so, wow, the preaching that's been done, and the good preaching about that verse, that what you may think has no meaning, God's using to save people, and there's glory coming from it, and praise God. And this is true. We serve that kind of powerful God who knows the end from the beginning, and has a purpose to fulfill his will. Okay, and that's all true. But Joseph, again, like I said, knew something that God had told him, and, was, and believed that. And he didn't know what would happen later. Now he knows. So now he's looking back and saying, well, look, God intended this to happen for good. 
He's not a Calvinist. He knows that because God is speaking here about saving the people to whom he's promised to preserve. He promised to preserve Abraham's seed, Isaac, and Jacob and his 12 sons because he promised to make a nation. In fact, he still had promises yet, full, yet not fulfilled in Genesis 50 that he had to fulfill. Yeah. And therefore, Joseph could have and did know that there were things that God was going to do that he had not yet done. And so he believed the things hoped for that God had promised his fathers. Right? He didn't have the scripture that you have complete, but he believed those promises. Okay? And so, you thought evil, but God meant it for good. This is this idea that God moved men by faith according to his will, and they did that. Romans 8, 28 is another popular passage, often linked to Genesis 50, 20. All things work together for good, right? To them who, are, who love God and are called according to his purpose. That last part's so important to that verse. Uh, this is the whole session in our seminar. But the, it speaks to the idea that I'm dealing with tonight about inspiration, that all things work together for good according to his purpose. Right? So when God moves men by faith to write according to his purpose, his will, that's how they're going to work together for good. Right? It's not according to man's will and purpose. So about the scripture specifically, uh, Peter writes, it's not according by the will of man that prophecy of the scripture came, but, but holy men of God were moved as they spake as they moved, were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so you see in that the idea that all the sufferings of the writers of the scripture, all the things that Israel went through, all the prophets of the scripture, those who died and were martyred and everything else, all those things where they said, well, this is a lot of suffering, what did God intend as he inspires the accounts of their lives and their responses in, in the subject matter we're covering tonight? He intended the Bible to come out of it. Amen. Right? And that's good. All things work together for good. That's the good if we apply it to the scripture, which you can do quite literally. Right? He intended those things for good because that's according to his purpose. And those men who wrote it loved him and believed him. Right? And so that's, that's where you apply verses like that. We'll cover more about that in our seminar coming up. So this is what we've learned so far in our series on inspiration in the scripture. God speaks, revelation, through men, that's what you call prophecy. The written words is what we call inspiration, and they were all given by God through revelation of the prophets, right? And God moved those men. How did he inspire them? He moved them because they believed what he said already, even though they didn't know what they were producing, to write according to the will of God. Right? And tonight we're going to cover how that this book, as we analyze what is actually written, the actual words and content, what type of content it is, how it's God's record of things. We'll cover tonight after, uh, in a bit here how the Bible, given by God, revealed to men who, moved by faith, wrote the words down, is a record it's not always something that God would endorse. And by that, I don't mean he doesn't endorse the Bible, which is the end product, but people who said things or did things in the scripture, it's not an endorsement of their behavior. There's things that are recorded that are bad, right? But they were recorded because they're true and they teach something, they communicate. And so this book, as we think about it being inspired of God and God's words, we should think of it as a record, as God's record. People make records of things. We make history books and accounts and statements of how things work, science books, things like that. This is God's account and perspective and record of how things are and were and will be. Right? So that's what we need to study tonight. So first, before we get to that, some of the details of that, uh, I want to talk more about this will of God idea. I know I might be stepping on seminar toes here, but this is we have to deal with this regarding inspiration. The Bible, which... When we use the word Bible, um, understand that word means the collection of books, a library of books, okay, is what that means. This one specifically is the Holy Bible, or the Holy Collection of Books. The Bible is a record of the will of God, of God's will. It's written by men, moved by his will. And when we study the Bible dispensationally, we're studying the will of God. We've said that before. When we say, what's the will of God? Let's study the will of God. What is God doing in the world? That requires what we call a dispensational Bible study. Call it whatever you want. You have to understand that God's will has been revealed, as we just explained, revealed progressively. And if it's revealed progressively, that means what God reveals at this time may differ from what he revealed at this time. Right? So thus the dispensational idea. In fact, the word dispensation itself doesn't talk about inspiration but more about revelation, 
like dispensation is what God gives, what he's dispensed. You can speak about God dispensing the Bible, but that's a little after the fact, because God didn't just drop the Bible down from heaven. But he does reveal things like that. Like God just speaks from heaven, and things just happen, right? And then after revelation, things get written down. So when we talk about dispensations, we're talking about what God reveals to people, what he said to people, when the things he says to people concern a change in what he's doing and how he operates with humanity. Well, this is how we make dispensational distinctions, right? We say, well, how is God, what's he doing in the world? Well, he's doing the same thing he was last week. He just said something else about it. Okay. Well, he's doing something different. Well, wait a minute. That's, that's a different type of thing. That's a revelation of something new, right? He's changing his operation. The times have changed, apparently. And so we talk about dispensational changes. So dispensational study is the study of the will of God. The Bible is a record of the will of God. And God worked in such a way to necessitate written content, a written record. Okay, and I, I want to walk real slow through this uh, because we're talking about a written record. Why does this have to be? Why do we need the Bible? Can't God just speak to us in our brains and our spirits? And, you know, why do we need this book? Because how God worked in the past, and we'll get to the fact how he works today, requires a written record. Okay, even though the people who wrote it weren't seeing the end of, of what God was doing to, the, uh, to produce the Bible, they did, by what he was doing in the past, seeing a necessity for a written, a written record. Okay, for example, look at Genesis chapter 2 in verse 4. <clears throat> From the very beginning, and I hinted at you in the last two lessons on this subject, that uh, the book of Genesis was probably written by more than just Moses. Um, you have uh, at least 12 different places in the book of Genesis that says uh, these are the generations of. And you look up the word generation in Genesis, you have about a dozen different times where it says that. These are the generations of Adam, generations of Noah, generation of Noah's sons, things like that. And it seems to be describing a break in the record of Genesis as if someone wrote the generations of Adam, probably Adam. You know, or something like that. And, and here's generations of Noah, as if he wrote that part of it. And here's generations of Esau, like he wrote that chapter. And so these are all compiled as a collected history of the origin, the beginnings of the nation of Israel, specifically, and the world, going back to the beginning. But Genesis 2, verse 4, you see one of the first ones of these. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of, of the earth when they were created. The first time that mention, is mentioned. Now, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth, and when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Did Adam witness that? Well, he didn't witness five days of it, maybe five and a half days of it. He didn't see that part, right? He was created on day six. So, so how did he know this stuff? Well, it was a little bit later, but Adam witnessed, when he was created in Genesis 2, he witnessed the world as it was good. For six days, God says it's good. First day, he created light, and it was good. Second day, and it was good. And third day, it was good. Every day was good. And finally, in Genesis 1, 31, at the end of the sixth day, he looks at all creation that he created, and he says, it's, six, it's very good. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning of the sixth day. What's interesting about that is that the seventh day is yet to occur, in which he doesn't create anything new. He rested, of course. But he doesn't say the seventh day was good. He doesn't say he made the seventh day of the Sabbath. He sanctified it. There's no comment that, and the seventh day was good. He doesn't say that. There were six days that were good. The seventh day God rested, right? Here's Adam and Eve and all creation there. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned. Adam lived when things were good. He also lived when things were bad. Like, you also live in times of bad, right? But he knew the good and the bad. He knew the good, and then when sin entered by one man and, and death by sin, he knew evil. Well, if you lived at a time where the course of human history no doubt is changing, um, writing that down wouldn't be a bad idea. Like, how did that occur? And thus, in Genesis 5, verse 1, you see the statement here. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in likeness of God made he him. You see that? Only Adam testifies to this, because once they start having children, they're out of the garden. Right? So how do you know what that was like? Made in the image of God. I thought we were made after you, Daddy. This is what Genesis 5, verse 3 says. They begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. He was made in Adam's image. Adam was made in the image of God. Adam didn't have an earthly daddy, right? 
And so you have this record of the creation of things that apparently Adam had a hand involved in writing, right? Now, just saying that I know it gets objections throughout our culture. Like we don't even think a literal Adam exists. Even Christians, many Christians don't think a literal Adam existed. But when the Bible speaks of such things, like the generations of Adam and puts them in genealogies, it's really an issue in that sort of belief system. But meanwhile, he witnessed both good and evil. Look at Genesis 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. There's another one. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. He probably wrote some of the scripture back here too. Because who would know what it was like before the flood? Noah and his sons. But only eight people survived that flood. Only eight people could actually speak about what happened before. Or carry the records of that. Because it would all be lost to history otherwise. And so Genesis 6, verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect. Just man and perfect before God. I might consider that a holy man. Yes? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Right? Writing some scripture here. And Noah walked with God. That's helpful. If you're going to maybe write down what happened before the flood. If you're going on a trip, I know it wasn't a trip, it was a safety mission to secure the life of humanity. But if you're doing that, don't you think it might be worthwhile writing a thing or two about how you got here? Right? Like, why did this occur? You look at Genesis chapter 6, and you read Genesis 5 and 6, and it talks about what happened before the flood and how it was before the flood. And then the flood occurred, and all the instructions God gave Noah and why he told him to build a boat and everything else. So that's going to be important. This is a big thing happening here. So again, put yourself in their shoes just for the intent of thinking through. What would you do if God spoke to you in Genesis chapter 6, down in verse 18, and says, With thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Now, the two is male and female. We know there's at least seven of the of kinds of animals in the next chapter. But when God makes a covenant with you, right, I'm going to write that down. Okay? Uh, I get a receipt when I buy, you know, a loaf of bread. <laughs> you know, I need a receipt for that. What if it goes bad? If God makes a covenant and says everyone's going to die but you, and this ark is going to get you through it, uh, yeah, I'd like a receipt on that, please. I'm going to write that down. God said, uh, you know, that's what I'm doing. So I'm trying to put you in the shoes here, these people writing scripture, that we don't see a verse that says God told Noah to write this. We don't see that verse, even though, even though other places God told people to write. And if God's making covenants, I'm writing them down, right? And I'm going to make sure I write them as God said them. Because if I write the covenant, distorting the truth a little bit, guess who's going to know? God, right? So you see, you see the pressure here. God makes a covenant. Okay, I'm going to write it down for my own assurance. And I'm going to write down particular according to God's spoken word, because I don't want to offend him. Wouldn't that lead to producing a product that is God's words? Yes, it would especially as we take into consideration the greater context that God has a purpose, a hidden purpose, to create the Bible from these holy men of God. God is moving Noah to build this ark, is he not? And it's not some secret move. He straight up told him, the water's coming. Build a boat. That's called God moving Noah, is what that's called. Like he's told him to his face. Uh, that's the best kind of movement right there. So God just tells you where to go. Imagine if God told you what his will was. Oh, just imagine. Come to our seminar in 11 days to figure that out, right? If God told you what he wanted you to do, he has, of course, right? <clears throat> Genesis 6, verse 22. Look what, he, what Noah says here. Thus did Noah, after the description of the boat, after he tells him what he's going to do and what he wants him to do, he says, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. I'm writing a contract that says, if I do this, I survive. Guess what I'm also going to do? When I finish the work... Finish the work. Done. Did what you said. Your turn to keep your part of the bargain. Right? But Noah obeyed. <clears throat> so then going back to the idea of that holy men of God spake, they're, they're trying to do God's will. What was God's will back here? Build a boat. That's faith that does that. You see? Did Noah know anything about the body of Christ? No. Did it matter? No. Could it produce scripture? Yes. He didn't know a Bible was being made, but what he was recording was going to be part of it because he was doing the will of God back here, you see. So all the covenants they recorded. So consider that the Abrahamic covenants given to Abraham. If Abraham makes, God makes a covenant with Abraham, he's going to do the same thing. In fact, look at Genesis 15. 
I've given these as examples to try to get us to think through before the flood, before Israel even, before Moses and Israel, which a lot of the scripture was written about them and through them, these people weren't Jews in the technical sense. I mean, they're historically the fathers of them, right? Of, we're all from Noah. But how did this scripture get written? Well, there's reasons that would motivate people to write it and to write it in such a way that God could inspire it <clears throat> because of what God was doing at the time, right? And this leads to what we'll deal with in a couple of weeks, how, how and why God is not telling us to write more scripture. Because that's not what God is doing today. But back here, when he's making covenants, and you're going, uh, God, where is that covenant written? He's going, I haven't written it down. You're going, I will. <laughs> but he's not making new covenants today with you. He's not creating some new revelation to you to describe something else that he wants you to do. There's no reason for you to write new things down. <laughs> but Genesis 15... We all are familiar with this because Paul quotes Genesis 15, verse 6, where it says he counted Abram's faith for righteousness, which is very helpful for understanding how we're saved as well. But in Genesis 15, in verse 7, God says to Abram, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. I have a folder this thick describing my property, the mortgage on it, and where, you know, how I got it, how I'm going to get it, and when it's mine, everything else. Right? This deck. That's like half my Bible. Right? Abram is given an inheritance. An inheritance, by the way, forever. You think he's going to, ah, take your word on it, you know. No, it's God. He's trustworthy. But my point is, writing a record seems to be necessitated here. In fact, that's what Abram asks him in verse 8. He said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Now, what a bold question that is. God tells you, I'm giving you this land. You're going, Okay, how do I know I'm going to get it? You mean besides the fact that your maker just told you who made the earth, you know, besides that? Right? But, you know, God is gracious. Understanding there's no Bible here, yeah. right? Maybe Abram misheard what he said. You know, maybe Abram heard, you gave me the whole earth and Mars. Who knows, you know? And so God here responds to him and says, take me a heifer of three years old and blah, and so on and so forth. And he tells him to get these animals. He's going to offer a sacrifice here. He's making a covenant. And there's been books written about this covenant being made right here, where there's a, a ritual here going on and, uh, to, to actually initiate some sort of agreement, as it was in the culture at the time and everything else. There's shadows and pictures of the, the way he does this covenant with other things that God will do later, of course, with sacrifices. But what he does is he offers these sacrifices and in verse 12, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. That is called future prophecy. Yeah. Okay? But it's also telling Abram, guess what? He says in verse 15, you're going to die. Now, in this way, it's a good thing Abram clarified. Because God said, I'll give you this land. He could have been waiting his whole life for it, which he was. But he asked, how do I know? And God said, well, you know because I'm God, but you're going to die. So you're not going to know the rest of your life. Besides, through faith in what I said. Right. So if God makes a covenant or a promise with you, and then he tells you, well, it's not you, but your children's 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 children that's going to possess the thing. I think also I'm going to write it down, right? Because I'm not going to let that thing die with me. Yeah, you know, God told me, I'm, I'm going to tell my children, and I'll probably write it down so they don't forget. Yeah. Now, again, at this point, I'm getting objections from the secular historians saying, well, these people couldn't read, they couldn't write back then, to which I have another objection. God made language, and he made them, right? And so just dig a little bit further, you'll find that people could read and write earlier than you thought, but... This is 15. He says in six, verse 16, In the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. It came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces of, of animals there. A smoking furnace, that's a pillar of smoke, and a lamp, that's a pillar of fire, right, passed through. Now what would later happen with the nation of Israel as they're walking through the wilderness? A pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire. This shows up again and again. So verse 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed, Have I given this land from the river of Egypt and the great river of Euphrates? So here's the technical details of where the, the land is marked off at. 
So he gives where the land's at. He makes a covenant with him. He says it'll happen to your future generations. All these are pretty good reasons that necessitate a writing down of what God said and making sure it's accurate. And the reasons we just gave are not God secretly tells him, I'm trying to write a book and I need your pages, you know. But that's not what's going on. You see what I'm saying? So there's a process of inspiration. When God's will goes from dealing through Abraham to forming a nation. Look at Deuteronomy 4. Now I'm going through a little dispensational chart here in case you didn't recognize that. Because there's the beginning of the earth here and there's Adam. And he's going to record what happened at the end of the earth. In Genesis 3.15 he tells the woman, Adam's wife, that your seed will bruise the head of this serpent that just caused you to destroy creation. I'm going to write that thing down too. Right? If I'm Adam, I'm like, yeah, okay, um, that's, that's important. That's our redemption right there. Right? Quite literally, it will end up being, you see. And so Adam is writing these things down. We see Noah writing things down because of the covenant God made with him. We see Abram writing things down because these are the generations of Terah, the generations of Abram's son, Isaac, and Jacob. So they have covenants that they're writing down here and promises. And then God works through Israel. We'll draw the Ten Commandments as representative of that, maybe a burning bush. Right? That's what represents Israel here. When God's forming a nation, that's a different will than through Adam. He didn't tell Adam to make a nation. He said, be fruitful, multiply. But nations said nothing about him. Right? He didn't tell Abram to go make a nation. He says, I will make a nation of you. But he didn't tell Abram to go make one. It's all about family with Abram. Just have, have children. Have a baby. Have a seed. You will have a son. Right? That's what it was with him. But with Israel, as Abram's children's children's children through Jacob multiplied in the time the prophecy came to be fulfilled, there's now a nation ready to be born. God delivers them from Egypt. And when you're forming a nation, you need documents. This is always the case. I'm not talking about filing documents with the UN or something like that. I'm just talking about documents that record what your nation is, where it's at, and what values and, that, it, that it constitutes. Right? This is just normal in any country. It's like, what makes you distinct from your neighboring country? Well, there's a border there that separates us. And we have a different governance. And we have a different law and value here. Well, it requires documents so that everyone in the country knows what defines the country. This is just how you make countries. And it wasn't only Israel that had documents. Other countries had documents describing such things. And so when God's will is to make a country, a nation, there's also documents. In Deuteronomy 4, he explains this to Moses. He gives them tables of stone. Remember that? So there's some documents there. He describes to Abram some of the borders of their nation. In Deuteronomy 4, verse 7 and 8, he says, <clears throat> For what nation is there so great? Oh, let's look, read in verse 6 here. Keep therefore and do them, these statues that I'm going to give you. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all, na all the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. They weren't the first nation ever, you see. They were just going to be a new one. Verse 7, What nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? What nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? What was the testimony that Israel was God's nation? The law and statutes he gave them. Well, how do other nations read about that? They're written down. Right? Now, again, this is kind of obvious. Of course, they're written down. But this speaks to the inspiration of Scripture. Right? So, when, you're, when God's will is forming a nation, you have documents talking about the founding of it or the genesis of that nation. You have documents that describe the laws of that nation, Exodus, the, the formation of that nation, the book of Numbers, right? The, how God ordained the thing. In Deuteronomy here, he's reiterating a lot of that. And so covenants and, and documents and legal documents are all written down back here. Look at Ezra chapter 4. Ezra is similar to Moses in this way, is that Ezra and Nehemiah and some of the others were going back to, um, going back to Israel to form a nation, right? By the time Ezra and Nehemiah are alive, Israel had been destroyed, scattered about. And they're going back to the city and the nation to reform it. So Ezra and Nehemiah have some similarities, and they're trying to reestablish the law that was given, though it's not new. But in Ezra chapter 4, verse 15, 
<clears throat> we have a letter here of people who are trying to stop the construction of this new nation. It's not new, of course, it's an old one. And uh, they're appealing to the king of the, the Persians here to stop this work. And it says in Ezra 4, verse 15, Search may be made in the book of the records of thy fathers. So shalt thou find in the book of the records, and know that this city is rebellious city, and hurtful unto kings and provinces, and that they have moved sedition within the name of old time, within the same of old time, for which cause this city was destroyed. So they're trying to say, don't let this city be built, because before it caused problems. Right? Now, this was secular record. This was record among the Persians, but they're appealing to that. Do you think God has a record of his own city and its own destruction? The prophets are that record, right? They were given revelation of God and spoke and then wrote a written record against the city, right? Or the city's justification. Okay, that's what those records were. Ezra chapter 6, years later, after Haggai pro prophesied to Israel to get busy and build what God told you to build, rebuild, <clears throat> again, they're, they're being opposed in this construction. Now, we're trying to build a building. We, we were trying to build a building a while ago, and we, we were dealing with some months with governmental authorities and documents back and forth proving who we are as a nonprofit, our identity, right? The septic tank we require, the dimensions of our building, everything else. And don't you think I kept a record of all that? I sure did, right? That's important. You get a building, you keep the records. That's what half of Ezra is. Half the book of Ezra is keeping the records because they kept objecting to our building this city, which God told us to, but, you know, everyone's objecting to it. To keep the records to justify what they're doing. In Ezra 6, Haggai, the prophet, in his book, yells at Israel, says, get busy, essentially. And they do that, even in front of the opposition. And as their opposition goes to the governors of the empire, in Ezra chapter 6, verse 2, there was found in Ekmetha, in the palace, that is in the province of the Medes, a roll, a book. A, there was a record thus written. And this is what the record said. The Bible contains this record. This record, by the way, was written by a pagan king? A Persian, Cyrus. Maybe he's not so much pagan in that he'd heard from Isaiah and all that, but it's Cyrus. The king, the same Cyrus, the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded. That, that helps. When you're having a dispute about whether the house should be builded, and Cyrus, the Persian, says, let the house be builded, that settles it. So guess what Ezra puts in his book? The, the record. As a record. In Israel's history. Right? So it's not only filed in Akmetha with the Persians, it's filed in God's book as well. Right? And you can go back and study Cyrus, which we did, and Isaiah, how a lot of what Cyrus did was actually prophesied by God and motivated by God's prophecies. So that's why I hesitate on the pagan there, because even though he was among the Persians, uh, there was a lot of connection between Cyrus and, uh, and Israel and what God had prophesied that he would do. He was uh, called the Savior of Israel back there in Isaiah. He was called the Deliverer and the Redeemer and all that as a, as a shadow of Christ. So meanwhile, forming a nation requires documents. That's my point. So God was working in such a way to necessitate a written report. Thus we have a scripture now as an end product, in part because of what God was doing before, required the writing down of these things. Now, just saying that God makes a record is one thing. We'll do it probably with our next lesson with the consequence of the written record. Because just collecting these things, I got files, these documents, and just sitting there collecting dust. I don't pull them out and study them and praise God for them. They're just there in a file cabinet, right? So there's a purpose for having them. But this book doesn't only have a record of the things. The record of what was occurring and what was recorded is actually profitable in a different way than what they were for Israel for everybody now. And so how is that possible? So this speaks to inspiration and God's purpose behind the record. Meanwhile, we can talk about court recorders in 2 Samuel chapter 8 and 2 Chronicles 34 and other places in the scripture. It talks about the recorders. And uh, during the days of the kings, and during the days of Israel's governance, there was always a recorder. There was a scribe and a recorder and a prophet and a priest. And these guys made records, right? Prophets got revelations, and sometimes they would write their prophecies. Other times they were recorded by the recorders. And they'd, they'd, they'd archive things and all that. The scribes would write them down. When you go into a court, there is a court transcriptionist, a court recorder. And they do nothing concerning the actual movement and motion of the court except to record everything that occurs. Yes? 
And that's helpful to go into an archive so that you can learn legal precedent, so that you can learn what happened, what justification is, is for such activities that happen today in our, in our cultural society. And it's the same thing that happened in the Bible. There's a lot of legal precedent back there with numbers and in the Kings and Chronicles that explain how the law was supposed to be interpreted, that explain the consequences of the law, or explain the failure to keep the law. If you go back and read the record, you go, well, that, that was a problem there, right? So you can read that record. The Bible is a record from God. So we can go back and read with the authority that God inspired this thing of what the record was that things happened. Speaking from the whole Bible perspective, you can also see that if God is going to judge man, right? God is not unjust. And as he accuses man or is bringing man before the court for their sin, and there's a defense made by man, and there's evidence against him. You want this recorded. God's not unjust. He doesn't just slap judgment on people in a sentence without going through the process of a righteous judgment. And thus the Bible itself as a whole is the record against humanity. It contains within it man's plea to God as sometimes we're good enough and God proves them wrong. Other times they say we're not good enough and God says that's right. And it contains within it the sentence for sin. It contains within it the judgment for sin. You see, the Bible is the God's court record with humanity. Ultimately, you come out of the courtroom justified and saved, not because you're righteous, because of Christ, right? Well, all of this is, is legal talk because the scripture is a record of what's going on between God and man. And so you have that not only literally in Israel's nation, but also spiritually about all mankind, it concerns salvation, all right? Look at the book of John. Look at John 1. John loves to use the word record or record. But in John, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, John did. He's a decent candidate for the book of Hebrews. Um, John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, and there's a lot of common language between his other books and Hebrews. That, leave it to yourself to study that out. But we'll leave Hebrews out of this discussion right now. John chapter 1. John is trying to prove a case in the Gospel of John. Unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which seem to be recording history of Jesus' earthly ministry, John, though he does so coincidentally, is, has a main purpose of trying to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. That's his point of writing his book, uh, that Jesus was not just a man, he was the Son of God. That's the point of the book of John. Okay? If you read the book of John and you conclude, oh, Jesus was a man, well, you can get that coincidentally, but that's, you missed the point. The point of the book is that he is the Son of God. He is from heaven. He is Christ. And so that's why in John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 1 verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Okay? Bearing witness or bearing record are very similar. Bearing witness is to say, well, yeah, I can speak to that. Bearing record is like, yep. That's what I'm going to testify here, bearing record. He came for a witness, bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. You see, over and over again, he's talking about bearing witness, because there needs to be evidence that this man is the light, is God, is the Word. Okay. And so down in verse uh, 15, John 1, 15, he says, John bear witness of him, and cried, saying, this is John the Baptist, by the way, this was he of whom I spake. He that comes after me is prepared, preferred before me, for he was before me. And so we have the witness of John the Baptist that John the Apostle is recording here. Down in verse 19. This is the record of John. This is the witness of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He goes on with this dialogue, right? Just like a court recorder, right? You see, the authors of Scripture were making a record for God. Their intent, John's intent, was to make a record here of evidence and proof that Jesus, he was making a case that Jesus was the Son of God. God's intent was to put this as part of Holy Scripture, inspired by him, so that we could all benefit from it. Because all Scripture is profitable, yes? That's 2 Timothy 3. John 1, 32 says, John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it bowed upon him. That's an important record. 
the Apostle John's writing these things that are just records of things that occurred. Okay, John 19.35. Let's look at John 8.13. John 8.13. The Pharisees therefore said unto Jesus, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Verse 14, Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. Well, this is a pretty decent argument here. This sounds like trying to figure out how we know who's true. Is Jesus true? Is the Bible true? Right? And he says, this is how I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whether I go, but you cannot tell whence I came and whether I go. Jesus is wise. In the process of getting inspired scripture, how do you know the Bible is true? You can't use the Bible. It says it's true. Of course it's going to say. That doesn't mean it's true. It bears record of itself. No, it does bear record of itself. Its record is true. Why? Because we know from whence it came. They don't know from whence it came. If God wrote it, it's true. They don't believe that. So they read it and say, well, of course anyone can say it's true. Anyone can just write a book and say it's true and it's got to be true. Well, that's not what we're saying. If God spoke it and he wrote it, there's going to be evidences of that in the content. We'll deal with that probably this next lesson, but that's what Jesus is pointing out here. Look at John 19, 35. You see, you wouldn't, you wouldn't learn that wisdom in epistemology unless you read the Bible. Genesis 8, verse 14. You'd be stuck thinking what the Pharisees thought. John 19, 35. He that saw it bear record, and his record is true. Now here he's talking about the soldier who pierced the side of Jesus. And blood and water came out. Okay. And he that saw it, that's a soldier, bear record, and his record is true, and he knows that he saith true, that ye might believe. Right? So he's speaking here about a, a true record. So there's all sorts of records of events. There are four different records of many events, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? When you see a crime, there's records of the event, different witnesses. Right? When things happen uh, in, in, in the news. Uh, understand, please understand, that there's more than one perspective. There's different witnesses. There's different records of it. If you're only ever reading one news source, you're going to be kind of mono, you know, simplified, one-dimensional. You need to maybe read a couple different news sources from maybe different perspectives to see whether or not, the, how different the perspectives are. If you read right wing and left wing, and they're pretty much similar, First, you've got to make sure they're both right wing and left wing, because that's another, another question itself. But then maybe it's similar to, to what actually happened. But if left and right see something entirely opposite, know this. <laughs> neither one of them probably are 100% true, or you've got to question what you're reading there. Right? And so this is how we determine such things. This is how you, you discern truth just in real life. And this is what John 1935 is speaking to as well. So John speaks a lot about the, this recording things and knowing things that are right or wrong. John 20, 31. John says, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. A true record should cause you to believe, will allow you to believe because of its truth. Right? 1 John chapter 1, verse 2. First John 1, 2. John writes, the life was manifested, talking about Jesus Christ, the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested unto us. So John said, we touched it, we handled him, we spoke to him, and we're bearing witness to you. So what does John say he's doing when he writes 1 John? He's bearing record. He's testifying. Put this down in the record. Right? This is what I'm saying, so that you might believe. Right? 1 John 5, verse 7. These verses are very controversial among Bible translators because they rip out verse 7. But 1 John 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and 11 are talking about a record, a true record. He says in verse 7, There are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth in the Son of God hath the witness in himself. There's the Holy Spirit. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, 
Paul says something similar when he says, the natural man knows not the things of the Spirit of God. Right? So it's like, if, if you believe, you'll know the witness because you'll have the Holy Spirit. You'll know it to be true. Because he believes not the record that God gave his son. This is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. So he's talking a lot here about the record or the proof or the witness that we have to know God's word is true. One other point I'd like to make here, look at Psalm 105, verse 10. When talking about the way in which God worked according to his will that caused men to write down scripture. When God makes promises that are forever, you know what that necessitates if it requires a writing something down? The thing written down to be forever. You understand? And so when God makes a covenant and says this is forever, then you shouldn't lose the document, right? Now, men lose stuff all the time. <laughs> things get destroyed and fires and things like that. Isn't it great to know in Psalm 119 that forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven? Amen. So if we lose a copy, God still has one. But Psalm 105, verse 10, it says in verse uh, 9, God, co which covenant he made with Abram and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law. We talked before about writing down laws, right? And to Israel for an everlasting covenant. See the everlasting part? What he promised Israel was everlasting, forever. Saying unto thee, I will give the land of Canaan and lot of your inheritance. Let's go back to Genesis 15. When they were but a few in number. It was an everlasting promise. Then that means the necessity for it to be written down is also an everlasting promise. That's why in Psalm 12, verse 7, it talks about God's words being pure. And the promise that he makes there, people say, oh, it's with the people, not the words. But the words are about the people. And therefore, the words also need to be preserved from this time forever. Psalm 12, verse 7. Right? Because if God's words get lost, guess what goes with it? The obligation of God to keep his promise. Yes? Because who of us can remember? Not, you know, we, we're people. Right? God never forgets. He's, his word is settled in heaven. But he promises to preserve the words because the words contain his promises. And that's, that's how that goes. I want to deal here with what time we have left, if at all, with um, what, what exactly was written down in Scripture and what this true record contains. When we talk about inspiration of the Bible, one of the ideas that we describe it as is the Word of God. God's words. We've already covered that, that the Bible testifies that to be the case. And it is the Word of God because God revealed it to people who are called prophets who wrote it down according to the will of God. But then you read the scripture and people bring out portions of scripture to say, well, God wouldn't write something like that. Or there are things in it that seem to discredit, they think, that it is God's word. And that's simply because they don't understand how it was inspired. And that's what I want to talk about here. Um, a true record, if you are a recorder and not someone trying to spread propaganda, is going to include a true record of things. Like the writers themselves, for example. When God uses people to record things down, the way he uses these people, you'll find personality in the people recorded down. Personal things about the writers are going to be included in the scripture. Okay? You'll find things about the culture in the scripture. You'll find things about history, like history that secular historians can discover too, outside the Bible. But you'll find that in the Bible too. We will we'll use those things as evidence and say, well, look, you don't need inspired scripture to know that. We learn that from reading the secular annals of history. But that doesn't just prove inspiration. Okay. Inspiration simply means that God spoke it through prophets to write it down. You learned it from other means. Okay. And so it records sin, for example. This is a big one. People read the scripture and they say, well, look what the Bible says. That's terrible. And look at these, these men there that God was working amongst. They're a bunch of sinners. They don't use the word sinners. You know, they're disgusting. You know, it records rape, incest, murder, often done by people who are writing the Bible or associated with people who had, the Bible, who had Scripture, right? And people use that to discredit the entire Bible as being of God, you see. Or wickedness is just recorded in humanity. Just the like horrible things. Judgments. Hell is one people pointing out and say, well, that God wouldn't write something like that. Which is kind of circular reasoning. It's not how would they know that, but... Uh, it records wickedness and the judgments against those who are wicked, the punishment of the wicked and all that. 
Sometimes they write in the first person. This is what people would think immediately when you think of inspiration of God. You think, well, you open the Bible and it's going to be God speaking to us. Like, I said this, and I say do this, and I say do this. So it says, thou shalt not, and thou shalt. That's in the first person. God is saying to you, you know, the second person to you, but God is speaking to us. Okay? And that's how people think of it. Right? And you do find this. In Romans 9.25, and 2 Corinthians 6, and other places, God speaks as I. The book of Isaiah, a lot of times Isaiah writes, and it's I, me, and my. And it's God talking, not Isaiah. Right? Um, 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says, God said, referring to scriptures, that he talks about my people, and I will dwell with them. That wasn't Paul dwelling with them. He said, God said this, and he's quoting the prophets of the Old Testament. I will dwell with them. They'll be my people. That's God speaking in, in, uh, from his perspective, right? There's also people writing in the scripture in the third person, which, again, is generally accepted. You say, well, if someone were writing for God, the prophets were writing for God, they might write third person. They might not write I, me, and my, unless God actually said those things. Uh, but they might hear things from God, Revelation, and then write down what they heard. Like, he, he said, thus saith the Lord, he said unto me. So John does this a lot. You know, he said it to me, and he said this, and he said that, and he said the other thing. First Corinthians 14, 37, Paul writes and says, the commandments I write unto you, what I write unto you is the uh, commandments of the Lord. So in the same sense, he's saying, what I'm telling you right now are the commandments of God. He didn't say, thus saith the Lord, but he's saying what I'm telling you is of the Lord, right? In his own words, right? But he's saying it, okay? So again, this would seem to fall under the umbrella of general understanding of inspiration of how that works. But then there's some problem content, which is what I want to talk about in the record here. It's not always by commandment. In 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 12, for example, Paul says something interesting here which causes people, by people I mean even those among the church, to question the inspiration of these passages. And if all scripture is given by inspiration of God, including these passages, then this is part of inspiration, of how that works. God moves holy men of God to speak and to write according to his will. And in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 12, here's Paul saying, To the rest speak I, not the Lord. That's interesting. In verse 10, he said, Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord commands. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Lord's commandment. Right. Verse 12, To the rest speak I, not the Lord. But if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, she be pleased to dwell with him, but not put her away. I, I'm not dealing with the content of the chapter necessarily, except for what he said there. What do you mean it's not of the Lord? Right. Like, this is just your, your opinion? Now, you might trust Paul, he's an apostle and everything else, and no doubt they would read it that way as well. Well, he's the apostle Paul, Christ is speaking to him, so this is instruction we're getting from him, this is going to be good and valid. But you have it in the Bible. So it's really not a problem for the readers of 1 Corinthians. They're accepting it as instruction from Paul, as from the Lord. But you have a Bible, so this is challenging what we're talking about. We have the end product of the Bible, and this is the Holy Bible, and all of us, the Word of God, and that part says, not of the Lord. What do we do with that? The Corinthians have an issue. They're trying to figure out the answer to the question. And he says, we'll do this. And you can read it the same way. You can read it just as if Paul is giving advice and say, well, I think we should do that because Paul said so. But the claim of the doctrine of inspiration is that God wrote the Bible. All of it is the word of God. Which is to say that people can write words that were God's words and not know they were writing them. Right? That's what the doctrine of inspiration could mean. Now, based on what we were describing on Sunday, how God moves men by faith, that's entirely possible, right? You, for example, make choices in your life by the understanding of God's words. You might preach a lesson or teach someone or spread the gospel, not quoting a Bible verse every time you're communicating the gospel. But what you're saying is from understanding the scripture. Now, you're not writing inspired scripture, but you see how Paul can do the same thing. If he were doing that, and yet God says, that's going to be scripture. That's just fine. Now the only question we have is not whether God can inspire it, but how do, how do you decide what things that people say, if they don't say, thus saith the Lord, is actual scripture. Well, this gets to canonization, it gets to identifying it. We'll deal with that in a future lesson. But inspiration, as the Bible defines it, can include things that people don't know they're writing by inspiration. I mentioned on Sunday, people could be writing genealogies, because God said, write the genealogy. They're writing the bureaucratic, administrative kind of record, and yet it ends up, being inspired scripture, right? 
Paul just says it outright. This say I, not the Lord. But a lot of writers of Scripture were speaking of their own volition. It's Peter who later says it wasn't by their will, but by God's will that it was done. Yeah. Right? And so it wasn't always the case that they knew that, as we've already established tonight. Okay? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 25, Paul says it again in the same chapter. We should tell you, by the way, 1 Corinthians 7 is a difficult chapter. <laughs> Because Paul himself is arguing with himself. The Lord said this, but I'm saying this. But the Lord's saying this, but I'm saying this. To you, God says it all. But it means it's not easy for Paul, apparently. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no command with the Lord. Yet, I give my judgment. Now you and I would say something like this. If God didn't say anything about it, just be quiet. Right? And here's Paul. The Lord didn't say anything about this to me. Yet, I got an opinion. And it's in your Bible. Maybe we should cut out that part. You know, this is Paul's opinion, warning. It's not in the earliest commandments of the Lord. You know, but it's in the Bible. Right. So again, the Doctrine of Inspiration says that God can move men to write, even when they don't know they're writing, what God is trying to end up producing. Because it's not even about why Paul's writing this to the Corinthians. It's about God writing a scripture, which none of the writers of the Bible knew what the end product would be. When Paul wrote 2 Timothy 3.16, he's writing a scripture. He didn't yet have a complete Bible because he was writing it. You understand? So every writer of scripture, none of them, had the full finished book. That's the end of what God was doing. Okay? And so that does not negate God's inspiration. But that's part of what, is, what could happen. Sometimes, look at 2 Corinthians. Well, he says it again, by the way, down in verse 40. It says, uh, she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. See, and that's kind of the point of it. Because here's my judgment. It says, uh, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord, but she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, which is to say, not the Lord's. But he says, I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Now, again, you might say, well, I trust Paul's judgment. Well, great, as a man you might, but he also has the Holy Spirit of God, which is a bonus. Like, I just don't mean you and I have the Spirit, like called as the Spirit, I mean... The Spirit moved him to write these things, so that's going to be a different thing than, than what you have. Okay? But you see in passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, where sometimes the writers of Scripture, and this happens quite often actually, just again, Paul is very honest in the way he writes, and he just says it outright. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 17, That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord. But as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Now in this chapter, he's trying to deal with the, the foolishness of the Corinthians and responding to the Corinthians uh, as a fool to their folly. Okay. Now the Bible says, don't respond to a fool according to their folly lest you be like them. Right? That's what the proverb says. And here's Paul actually doing what that verse doesn't instruct. Paul says, you guys are fools, are thinking like fools, and as a fool, this is what I'll boast in. Look at everything I've done. Look at all the accomplishments I have. Right? And that's, he says that in Philippians 3 as well. And you heard Paul doing that, and you get his personality bit through that a little bit, but it also communicates to the Corinthians. But it also raises the question, is that God's words? Well, Paul's writing them, remember. God's writing them through Paul. So you're reading about what Paul was saying to the Corinthians. Inspiration, which is the final product, deals with God saying, those are the words I want written down. Those are the words I want part of my record. So when Paul writes that and says, I speak not as the Lord, but as a foolish man, because God's not foolish, right? So why would God's word contain foolish comments in it? Because Paul's writing it. And God wants the record to contain what he wrote, even foolishly as a man, in order for us to understand, as the Corinthians understood, how foolish they were being. It's part of God's record. The inspiration of the Bible is a record of God. Not something simply that God would utter everything that occurred in it. Because there's many things in the scripture God himself would never say. I mean, think about that. There's things in the words of God, the Bible, the Holy Scripture, that God himself would not say except for as a record. You know what I'm telling you? Like He would say them as a record, like this is what happened, this is what he said. But there are lies in the Bible. There are sins in them. There are blasphemies recorded in the Bible. God doesn't sin. He doesn't lie. But it's God's true record of such things. Okay. Sometimes the writers of the Bible um, would record things that were not witnessed. In Genesis chapter 1, for example, 
that whole chapter was not witnessed by anybody. Who wrote that down? As far as I know, there's no tablet from heaven coming down with Genesis 1 on it. Someone wrote it. How did they know? By revelation. God spoke by revelation things they could not know because they weren't there. He told it to prophets who wrote it down. It could have been Adam. It could have been Moses. We don't know for certain who that was, but we know God can speak to man and tell them things they weren't witnessing for. Right? Well, inspiration is simply, again, the, the written product. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. God revealed things to men who by faith wrote things down, and what ended up being was the holy scriptures that were God-given. Okay? It's his record is what we're talking about when we talk about inspiration. In 1 Samuel 28, you go back there and you read about Saul. Now, who wrote the book of Samuel? Samuel probably handed it, if not Ezra and some others. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, the story of Saul and the witch of Endor. Remember that? Not only do we have an account here of a king of Israel practicing witchcraft, which was forbidden by the law, and thus you're going, well, this is the word of God? A description of history is not the same as a prescription or some, an instruction to tell you to do something. You're reading this as a description. But in 1 Samuel 28, you have Saul who, who's calling upon a witch. Okay. In verse 7. He said unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Now, this whole event here, Ezra was not at. Samuel was not at. This is like a secret thing. Like, Saul's not doing this publicly. You don't read in the newspaper, Saul's going to find a witch at Endor. You don't do that, because this is all a secret deal. Then how did Samuel, or how did Ezra, how did the writer of this book know what was going on? The conversation between Saul, the king of Israel, and his servants in private. How do you know that? Revelation, right? So again, I, I'm trying to show you how inspiration works. It's a record of God, not an endorsement of God. And a lot of times it's by revelation because the people who wrote it did not know what was happening. So they would not know otherwise. Another example, example of that is 2 Samuel 11, verse 2. In 2 Samuel 11, you have the story of David and Bathsheba. It's a very popular story. It came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from his bed, which Samuel was sleeping next to him. Right? No. And he walked upon the roof of the king's house, and there's Samuel up there. Nope. No, no. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And here's Samuel from his house looking the same way. No. <laughs> like, he wasn't there. The woman was very beautiful. How did Samuel know? He wasn't there. This is all by revelation. A prophet knew this. In fact, Nathan was the one who eventually uh, calls out David here. God reveals by prophecy things that occurred that they didn't even witness. You see? It's a true thing. This is one instance of prophecy that he's fulfilled in his own life because God told him what was happening. Nathan goes to him, tells him what happened, and David's convicted of his own sin because it was true. It was a true record. Right? That's how inspiration works, is that God reveals things to people and write things down, even though he wouldn't say them, he didn't do them. God's not committing lust here. David is. He's recording the event, okay? John eleven forty nine 49 is another example of this. You remember when the, the, the priests had a conference to kill Jesus in John 11? That's a private conference. Ask yourself, who is there? Is the apostle John there? He's writing the book of John. No, he's not. Like, are any of the 12 apostles there? No. There's Caiaphas, and even says Caiaphas is prophesying. So Caiaphas is prophesying some words, or saying some words that God put in his mouth, and he wasn't even a believer. That's interesting. And here's John. John's the one writing it down, not Caiaphas. He's a man of faith writing things down. By revelation, John knows what they said in private conference. Was, was that a rumor? Like we heard a rumor that they met in private. Conspiracy theory. Well, if you believe those things to be true, you've got to believe in revelation. God speaking to these people, those events. Okay? And so sometimes the things were not even witnessed. Sometimes there are things they could not explain. They, would, they could not know. 
1 Peter 1 talks about the prophets writing things in which they inquire and search diligently because they did not know all the things that were given to them to write as they concerned salvation through Jesus Christ. And Peter writes about that. Okay, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4, Paul says, I knew a man who was in the third heaven. Remember that? He heard things that were not lawful to utter. Why did you write that, Paul? Right. But apparently there's things that they could not write. They could not explain. Right? Luke 18, 34, things were happening and the disciples did not understand it. Right? They later would, but they didn't at the time. So inspiration doesn't always require the writers to know that they're writing Bible, to understand what they're writing, okay? It, it may require God telling them things that they are not privy to. Other places in Scripture, God takes the prophets and puts them, like in a vision someplace, like in Ezekiel. God would take Ezekiel in visions to rooms in the temple. Remember that? Or like there's rooms in the temple where the priests are conspiring and doing things, and God in a vision takes Ezekiel like over there and says, look at this. You know, he's looking through a wall and seeing these priests you know, steal money and everything. It's like, well, he actually saw that, but God took him there by vision. As a house could that occur? How could Ezekiel know what was going on behind closed doors? You know, Daniel has some instances like that where God gives him interpretation of the dream. It's like he didn't know otherwise. Men don't know. God does. And so inspiration concerns such things, and that's how we know it's God-given. It's, the Bible contains a lot of wicked things. Read Genesis 38 about Judah's incestual relationship, right? God is not there teaching the acceptable nature of such actions. There's like a point made, Genesis 38, about Judah and his response to what occurred, his neglect, which is what caused what occurred to occur, his sin, then also his response to it. Judah would eventually get a prophecy about his family line that the Messiah would come through. Not because of what he did in Genesis 38. His response had some help to that. His faithful response. But there's a lot of sins recorded in the scripture of many of the people who wrote Bible or associated with, with God's will that um, he is not telling us to follow their pattern. We don't follow Paul in his sins. He had sins. We don't follow him in that. Right? We don't follow David in his sins. We don't follow Judah in his sins. And, and yet... Their sins are recorded as part of Scripture because God wants the record of that so that you know sometimes what to avoid, what to be wary of. Okay? It's getting late in the hour, so we will stop there in our outline. We'll pick it up on Sunday about um, maybe a final lesson on inspiration here, explaining inspiration and what it means uh, after these three lessons. Any questions or comments about